Hi everyone, welcome back to the third part of this chapter. There's a lot of information to cover in this chapter, I know. Um, the next chapter is going to be much, much shorter, so um, stick with me. Next, we're going to talk about tectonic landforms. And these are landforms that are created from existing crust. Um, so not new crust being formed, but crust that is already there. Um, and this happens in two ways. Um, the first is by faulting. Um, which creates these cracks in the Earth's crust, which um, here you can see a landform um, as a result of faulting, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And the next one is folding, um, which is the crumpling the, of the crust as it moves together, as it gets pushed together and compressed. Um, folding is a little more intuitive than faulting is, um, but I'll uh, try to explain that as much as possible. Um, read about it more in your book. It's a little easier to explain in a traditional classroom where I can kind of draw on the board. Um, but uh, we'll see how well it goes here. Um, so we have something called faults and blocks. So faults are the cracks from the stress of moving crust, um, which is pretty intuitive. Um, and the blocks are the crust on either side of that fault. Um, these are not plates, right? This is um, Nevada. There's no plate boundary in Nevada, but Nevada is feeling the pressure of the plate boundaries that are to the west of it. And so most of these faults exist within plates. Again, we're not going to talk necessarily about plate boundaries, um, but there can be plenty of faults um, within plates themselves. Um, they're very common um, in some places and more than, in more than others. Um, so again, Nevada is full of these faults. Um, so there are four um, types of faults that I'll go through here. Um, the first one is a normal fault um, where you get vertical motion and the stress is from these two blocks pulling apart. And what you get in um, as a result of that is this fault um, scarp. So you get this upthrown block and this downthrown block. Um, it's a little bit intuitive, counterintuitive that you would pull something apart and something would get pushed up. But basically, as these two blocks are pulling apart, um, the, the crust has to make up that surface area somewhere. And so it winds up up throwing a block and down throwing a block in order to get the surface area right here. And so it leaves that fault scarp. The second type is a reverse fault. Um, where you're also getting um, vertical motion, but this is the stress of blocks um, pushing together, um, not pulling apart. But similarly, you're also going to get a fault scarp. These two things are going to push together and it's going to push some stuff up. The next type is a thrust fault. Um, and again, vertical motion, you're going to get stress from the stresses from the pushing of the blocks together. Um, you're going to get, um, they're going to push apart like this, right, as opposed to in this direction. Um, and you're still going to get that upthrown block and that downthrown block. You're still going to get that fault scarp, but it is going to be much less prominent um, than the fault scarp that you get from a normal or reverse fault. And the last is a strike slip fault, and that's from a horizontal motion. So it's like a transform boundary that we talked about before. Um, the stress is from that kind of twisting of the crust as it pushes past each other. Um, and the features are just kind of this visibly offset, right? We looked at that, that um, drainage before. You can see here, it's a little bit hard to see because it's tiny, but you have a river that was here and now you have a river that's here. And this, these things used to line up, but you get no visible um, scarp. Um, and so this, these faults um, can create what's called a basin and range to topography. And so again, there's Nevada again. And this is from the stress of the crust pulling apart. Um, and it creates these parallel normal faults. And so when we look at uh, the topography of Nevada, we can clearly see um, these parallel faults that are happening. Um, and so some blocks um, rise to form hills, um, which are called um, horse. Um, and some blocks fall to form valleys, which are called grabens. And so we can see here, um, as this is pulling apart, you're getting all of these different scarps, you're getting these tilted blocks, and here is your horse, and here is your graben. Um, so you get tilted blocks with one steep side and one gently sloping side. And this is a huge part of the, the topography um, in Nevada. 
So the next time you drive through Nevada, should you have occasion to, um, you can notice this uh, landscape. We also get folding that happens. Um, and this is when stress is compressing the crust together. Um, and so we get anticlines and synclines. Anticlines is the ridge that folds up. Synclines is where it folds down. And so you can see um, this um, action happening here as this gets pushed together. You imagine if you take a piece of paper and slowly compress it, um, it would kind of try to do this little bit of a wavy thing. Um, we can see this visible evidence in the strata. When we look at the layers of rock, we can see this folding very clearly happening. Um, and so here um, is an example of it. You can see how this is folded and how it looks like this from that compression that has happened. Um, this is a landform in China that it, um, is really, really beautiful. Um, different types of minerals have oxidized that gives you these colors. Um, but again, you can see how this has all been folded together and pushed up. We can see that from this strata. Um, we can also see that with the, the Pennsylvania, the Appalachian Mountains um, in Pennsylvania. Um, the Susquehanna River um, is older than uh, the folds. The Susquehanna River is one of the oldest rivers in the world. Um, and we can tell that the river um, formed before the folds did, because otherwise um, water never flows uphill, right? So otherwise it would kind of move around all of these folds. But the fact that the river is cutting through the folds, we can tell that the river formed first and then the folding happened second. Next, we're going to talk um, about earthquakes and tsunamis, which uh, um, I believe is the last thing that we will cover in this chapter. So um, earthquakes are a release of built up pressure along fault. In Southern California, we're pretty familiar um, with earthquakes. They can be pretty devastating. Um, you can see a picture of the, the 1906 um, earthquake in San Francisco um, and the 1994 earthquake um, in Northridge, uh, California. Um, and this is how uh, plates move, right? Those plates are moving, there's a buildup of pressure and eventually that pressure will be too much um, and the plates will have to move very quickly. Um, it happens really, really frequently. I'm gonna give you a link to um, a USGS website. There are earthquakes that are happening all the time that we just don't feel because they're relatively small. Um, but there's a good chance when you go to that website um, that an earthquake will have happened in the past hour in our region, but we just don't feel them. We only feel the bigger ones. Um, they are more frequent and powerful along plate boundaries, which makes a lot of sense. They happen away from plate boundaries, but they are less common. Um, and so um, there was one, uh, two in China in 2008, 2013. Um, uh, one in New Madrid in 1811, 1812. So they happen, but they are very, very common along these plate boundaries and much less common away from them. And so where have we seen earthquakes in the past um, several years, right? So if we look here at all of our plate boundaries, um, here is where our uh, ring of fire is. And then we look at where um, our earthquakes happen, right? Our earthquakes happen mostly along those um, plate boundaries. Um, here we are in uh, Southern California. Um, we measure earthquakes um, in two ways. Um, the first one is the magnitude, um, which is an algorithmic thing. Each digit is 10 times stronger than the next. Um, so a uh, 7.0 is 10 times stronger than a 6.0 is 10 times stronger than a 5.0. Um, the second way we measure them is by impact. Um, it's the effect of the quake on human life or property ex or et cetera. Um, most of the time we hear it in terms of um, magnitude. Um, they'll say that was a 7.1 um, or 6.5. Um, high magnitude does not always mean it's going to be the most damaging because it kind of depends on um, where it occurs, what types of structures are there, how many people are living there, how deep the earthquake was. And so the Baja earthquake um, in Easter in 2010 was um, 7.0 magnitude, which resulted in four deaths. Um, the Haiti earthquake in 2010, same magnitude, 
316,000 deaths. Um, different type of earthquake, much more people um, concentrated around it, um, much more damage, um, structures that were not um, ready for that um, earthquake to happen, many, many structure collapses as opposed to the Baja earthquake. Um, we also um, are going to talk about tsunamis, um, which we hear about um, with some frequency, I feel like, in the news these days. Um, but tsunamis happen when you have subduction that's happening. That animation is going to keep going. But um, this subduction is happening. Eventually, that plate um, gets pushed up and water is displaced. So you see this thing is getting pressure. Poop, there it goes. And it pushes up water. And then that water um, gets displaced. They can travel thousands of miles, right? The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which was really, really devastating, um, reached the coast of Africa, um, had its biggest effects um, in um, Asia. But if you were out in the ocean, you probably won't even notice the tsunami. That wave um, gets compressed as it gets near shore and it gets higher and higher and higher and higher. You're going to watch a video of um, the Japanese tsunami as it came into shore um, and the type of damage that it did. But if you were a, on a boat out here, you wouldn't even notice the tsunami. It's just as that w those waves come in, um, it gets compressed together, compressed together, um, and then the wall of water gets higher and higher. And so again, Here's the um, Japanese tsunami of 2011 um, that you'll watch a video about. Um, there were 16,000 deaths um, from the quake and the tsunami combined, right? So the, the quake happened pretty close to the shore of Japan. Um, the tsunami, on a much smaller scale, reached all the way um, to the west coast of South America. It didn't really do any damage. Japan is um, very, very well equipped to deal with tsunamis. They have a tsunami alarm system that goes off. Um, People um, know what to do when they hear that alarm. They need to get to higher ground. Um, but there were still, um, even um, in this very well-developed country, um, 16,000 deaths um, due to the magnitude of that tsunami. Um, the Indian Ocean tsunami that happened in 2004 had roughly 250,000 deaths. Um, and so we want to think about why that happened. Um, you have a lot of people um, living in very low-lying areas. Um, not a warning system um, for them. And so when you have these low-lying areas that go very, very far inland, um, that wave can go quite far inland, um, carrying lots of debris. Um, it can be very, um, very, very devastating, especially um, in uh, poorer nations. And so what happens before a tsunami comes in too is if you are standing on the shore and all of a sudden the tide goes out really, really far, really, really fastly, um, you need to get away from that shore as much as possible um, because that wave is going to come in um, quite quickly. So during the um, Indian Ocean tsunami, um, there's um, video of, you know, tourists in Thailand um, who were on the beach. That tide went out and those people walked out to see what was happening. And then that wave came in um, and got them. So that is the end of this chapter. Thanks for sticking with it. Um, it was quite long. Our next chapter um, is weathering and mass wasting, which I'm going to try to do in just one um, part. Um, so I will meet you back here for that.